Welcome to the first lecture. In this lecture, we will get a brief introduction and motivation to microservices and event-driven architecture. And later, we will talk more about the problems those modern architectural styles solve for us, setting the stage for the exciting topics we will learn throughout the course. So let's get some motivation for microservices first. Microservices architecture is the most modern and popular architectural style in the industry. In this architectural style, our entire system is organized as a collection of independent services. Each has its narrow scope of responsibility and is fully owned by an independent team of developers. If you attend any serious software architecture conference, you will find that many talks revolve around microservices, and for a good reason. Most of the biggest and most successful tech companies nowadays use microservices architecture, and it's considered one of the biggest contributors to their success. When done correctly, microservices architecture allows organizations to scale to thousands or even tens of thousands of engineers, divided into small teams that operate independently. This, in turn, enables those organizations to build highly scalable systems that reach billions of users, all of that while keeping their operational costs low and staying efficient and innovative. Here in this information, it's hard not to get excited and start refactoring your own code base into microservices. However, while most of the buzz around microservices is very positive, a sizable number of organizations found themselves seriously struggling and even going back on their decision to use microservices. And that's because microservices architecture alone is not a silver bullet that solves all your problems. When applied correctly and under the right conditions, microservices architecture can really do wonders. But if applied incorrectly or at a company that isn't ready for this change, it can introduce a lot of unnecessary overhead without bringing any benefits. But no worries, in this course, we will cover everything you need to know about microservices architecture. This includes the prerequisites and the correct steps for migration to microservices, best practices and industry proven patterns for using microservices correctly, and also how to efficiently test, deploy and troubleshoot microservices in production. So by the end of the course, you will have all the intuition and the skills to get the most benefit from this architecture. And more importantly, the knowledge on how to avoid common mistakes, pitfalls, and anti-patterns, saving your company valuable time, money, and frustration. As a side benefit, it will also help you with system design interviews, because microservices related concepts come up a lot, especially when interviewing for a senior role. Now, in addition to microservices, we will also cover another architectural style called event-driven architecture. While event-driven architecture isn't new and doesn't require microservices, it is commonly used together with microservices. By establishing asynchronous event-based communication between microservices, we can achieve an even greater decoupling and higher scalability for our company. Event-driven architecture is also very useful for implementing some very powerful design patterns for microservices architecture, which we'll also cover during the course. So now that we got some motivation, let's talk about the problems we're trying to solve using microservices and event-driven architecture in the first place. If we think about the architecture of a typical web-based company, we can divide it into three logical and physical tiers. The first one is the presentation tier. This tier contains the client-side front-end code and runs on the user's mobile devices, tablets, and web browsers. 
The second middle tier is called the logic tier, sometimes referred to as the application tier or the business tier. This part of the system runs all of our business logic that handles all the interactions between our users and our system. And finally, we have the data tier. In this part of our system, we store all the necessary information about our customers or business in persistent storage. This typically includes a database, but in some cases can also involve storing files on the file system directly. This three-tier architecture is also commonly called the monolithic architecture. And that's because all the business logic and the backend development are concentrated inside a single code base, which is the application tier. It's also deployed at runtime as a single monolithic process. Now, before we go anywhere, it's important to acknowledge that this three-tier architecture is still the most commonly used architectural style because it provides many great benefits out of the box. The first benefit is designing a system using this architecture is very easy. The reason for it is this monolithic architecture fits almost any web-based system, regardless of the industry or the service it's providing, be it an online news magazine, a stock trading service, a dating service, or an online bank, the system's architecture can be exactly the same in all those scenarios. The second benefit is that it's very easy to implement. With a small team of full-stack developers and a few off-the-shell web frameworks and standard database technologies, we can easily have a fully functional system following this architecture. So if we're a small startup company that wants to get our idea into the hands of users quickly, or we're just a company with a small development team, this architecture is the best choice. To quote Jeff Bezos, the founder of Amazon, the perfect size of a team should be small enough that it can be fed with two pizzas, which is the key to efficiency and scalability. So if your company fits this model, there's no reason to use anything more complex. However, as our company gets more successful and our development team keeps growing, we start running into more and more issues, far more serious than not being satisfied by two pizzas. The first issue is low organizational scalability. With too many engineers working on the same code base, code merge conflicts become a serious problem. Essentially, everyone is stepping on each other's toes and completing even the most trivial feature becomes slower and harder. To deal with those issues, we need a lot more planning and coordination, which typically means more meetings. And the more people we have in those meetings, the longer and less productive they become. But the number of engineers is not the only issue. As we add more features to our application, our code base becomes larger and more complex. This makes it harder to reason about. It takes longer to load it in the IDE, slower to build and test, and riskier to deploy. So as a result, our release schedule becomes less frequent, which actually makes things even worse because now every new release contains even more features, increasing the chances of bugs and outages. Finally, onboarding new developers now takes more time as it is much harder for them to get familiar with this large code base. So essentially, with every additional engineer in the team, we start seeing diminishing returns until we reach a point where adding more people to the team actually reduces everyone's productivity. But besides low organizational scalability, a large monolithic application can also have technical problems, making the system less scalable. Each application instance, which contains our entire business logic, requires a lot of CPU and memory. So instead of using cheap commodity hardware, we need to run each instance 
on a more high-end and expensive computer. We're also very constrained to the technology choices we potentially made many years ago, and we can't take advantage of new and better technologies. Refactoring our code base, even from one library to another, can be a huge effort, let alone considering a new programming language or a framework. Another problem is our application also becomes less stable. Even a small memory leak, performance issue, or a bug can affect our entire system and may require us to perform a rollback. It's important to call out that logically separating the monolithic application into layers, modules, or even libraries can help only so much. But at the end of the day, all those different modules are still tightly coupled together. We're still constrained to using the same technologies and programming languages, and the application still needs to be deployed as a single runtime unit. So now that we fully understand the problem we're trying to solve and the conditions for considering another architectural approach, we're ready to explore the alternative to monolithic architecture, which is microservices architecture. Before we do that, let's quickly summarize what we learned in this lecture. In this lecture, we got the motivation for microservices and event-driven architecture. We learned that microservices is one of the biggest contributors to the success of the biggest and most successful companies in the industry, which is why this architectural style is so popular. At the same time, we also learned that it's not a silver bullet, and to get the full benefit from it, we need to understand when to use it and how to use it correctly. Finally, we discussed the three-tier architecture, which is commonly referred to as the monolithic architecture. During this discussion, we mentioned that this is a perfect choice for startup companies and companies with a small development team and a relatively small code base. However, when the company and the code base grow, the monolithic architecture has both organizational and system scalability issues. So to solve those problems, we will dedicate the next few hours to learning two modern and very popular architectural styles, starting with microservices architecture. I'll see you guys in the next lecture.